Well, welcome to an episode of Christ and Culture. My name is Pastor Jeff Short. Today we're going to be talking about something I've covered about two or three years ago. Uh, made a video on this and made commentary on this a few years ago when it became headlines. Once again, we're seeing in, uh, for example, Yahoo News. We have right here Yahoo News. Uh, it says, Pastor accused of sex abuse says he's ready to preach again. And that's, that's an important headline. It says that he says he's ready to preach again. Well, this is the problem. Um, you have people who have abused congregations, who have abused people, uh, sexually abused individuals, and now they're coming back and saying, yes, I'm ready, I'm, I'm, I recovered, um, I've learned my lesson, so now I deserve to have a platform, uh, give me a platform, I'm ready, I'm okay, I got this, I'm good, can step back into ministry, no problem. And he is saying he's ready to preach again. The problem is, I don't think the body of Christ should be ready for him to step in as a pastor again. So let's read the article here in Yahoo News, and I'll do a little commentary also on the article uh, as we go to certain key points. It says, while preaching to his new Florida congregation last Sunday, Pastor Tullian Chavidjan spoke at length about how God offers unconditional, unconditional, unconventional, and sometimes downright infuriating grace to everyone, even those society considers an outcast. Chavidjan referred to the biblical story about Jesus interacting with a group of men with leprosy, people who were outcasts from their communities as a result of illness. You could no longer work at the job that you had. You could no longer be around the people that you loved. You were basically dealing with this death sentence, Chavidjan told his Palm Beach Gardens Church, describing the experiences of people with leprosy during Jesus' time. But then the Bible says Jesus healed the men, restoring them to their old lives. The one thing that seems to annoy people the most about God is his willingness to love, forgive, and restore those who have decided, we have decided to, deserve the exact opposite Chavidian preach. He could very well have been thinking of his own story. And that's the point. That's the problem now. Because when you, as the perpetrator, as you, as the sinner who has made um, a mess of the church and your marriage and everyone around you, when you start preaching uh, that people should love and accept and tolerate and forgive and reconcile and all this stuff, it rings hollow because it seems to be self-serving. Of course, Tully and Chibijan would want people to uh, tolerate, forget, forgive, accept, re-embrace, um, let bygones be guy, bygones, let's start over, everything. Of course he would want that to happen because it would be in his best interest for people to do that. Um, but just because Tullian wants this done doesn't mean that Christianity needs to follow him in his self-serving, self-interest theology. Yes, Jesus is offering grace and forgiveness for to all who repent and who are um, sorrowful and who confess their sins and so on and so forth. But to talk about the group of people who were ill and had leprosy through no fault of their own and then equate that with his situation that is totally his fault... I mean, he is the one who uh, instigated these scandals, and he's the one that um, brought shame and disrepute upon the name of Christ, and now he's trying to, um, in a sense, play the victim. Now, about three, two or three years ago, when he began to uh, be exposed f for his, his, his sins, 
Uh, and he was on all kinds of uh, interviews and he was giving his interviews. And, and even recently I saw him on an interview and it was all about how much suffering he's gone through, about how the hardships came into his life and his journey of pain and all this stuff. And it was all about him and all about his perspective and all he's gone through and yada, yada, yada. Well, the problem with that approach is that he's failing to also give voice to the people that he caused pain to. And he's failing to take into consideration their pain. So we get more of that same attitude about him playing the victim and downplaying the pain and victimhood of the people that he hurt. And that's the problem. That's the problem. It says um, that he could be very well talking about his own story in telling these Bible stories. It says, Tavidjan, a grandson of the famous late American evangelist Billy Graham, was booted from positions at two Florida churches for sexual misconduct in 2015 and 2016, including a relationship with a woman that he was involved with, describes as sexual abuse. Okay. Um, well, that doesn't mean it actually was sexual abuse, but let's just say that for the sake of argumentation that she's describing something accurately and that it was a actual uh, form of sexual abuse. We don't, we shouldn't automatically in all cases believe what a woman says about her experience. Um, this is the Me Too movement. This is the error of the Me Too movement because the Me Too movement says you are always to believe the woman in every single instance and never question her because if you question her, you're making her more of a victim by your questions. So that's not tenable. That is not a rational position. No, we don't believe automatically every story that comes from someone who happens to be a woman. We should check out their story, check out the credibility, check out their credibility, and check out the facts and, and, and double check the facts and the scenario that they give. And if everything checks out and cooperates with other facts, then yes, we should believe them, but not automatically. Just like any accuser, you don't automatically believe them. You don't automatically dismiss them either. You don't automatically disbelieve them. You hold them in sort of a limbo state until you can check out their facts and then um, make a determination based on the facts, not just because someone is telling you something. So, but for this, uh, and he has already admitted his uh, affairs. And so for this uh, argumentation, let's just assume that this woman is describing the situation correctly. But despite his past, Chavidjan insists that because of God's grace, he's now rehabilitated enough to return to the pulpit and lead a congregation. The one thing I've learned about God's grace is that there is no end to it, recovering addict. That's what he wrote. He tweeted, Chavidjan has started The Sanctuary, a new non-denominational church. A new non-denominational church. Um, that seeks to be a judgment-free zone where people can come as they are and not as they should be. The pastor is insisting that his murky past is precisely what makes him qualified to minister to broken people. Now, what's very strange about this is that he's the one advocating for his return to ministry and to pastoral ministry. In other words, he's the one that's advocating that he is now qualified to lead a congregation again, like he was before. And that he's all set, he's good, he's got this, everything's fine now. He's the one that's advocating. That's not the way it should be in the Christian church. The Bible outlines some very specific things for eldership or leadership in the church. 
And one of the qualifications, just one of the qualifications, there are all kinds of qualifications, but just one of the qualifications is that he has to have a good reputation for those outside the church, from, from those outside the church. He has to have a good reputation of people outside the church. Now, does Tellian Chavidjan really have a good reputation with those outside the church? Well, no, he certainly does not. He has been the source of scandal for those outside the church. He has been someone who people outside the Christian faith and outside the Christian church point to and say, see, that's what pastors are like. They're hypocrites. They're two-faced. They're preaching this message of sexual purity and a moral standard while at the same time they're violating their own standards and they're holding people to a higher standards that they themselves are willing to hold to personally. And so people outside the church look at Tullian and people like him as hypocrites. And they say, why should I be a Christian when Christians are hypocrites? So if you go down the list of qualifications that the Bible outlines for leadership, Tullian doesn't look like he really matches up. It says he started the sanctuary, a new non-denominational church that seeks a judgment-free zone where people can come as they are and not as they should be. The pastor is insisting that his murky past is precisely what makes him qualified to minister to broken people. No, that isn't necessarily so. Now, you don't have to be a drug addict to offer the help of God in your life over drugs. You don't have to be a drug addict. You don't have to be an alcoholic to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to an alcoholic. Now, if you're an ex-drunk, ex-drug addict, you understand better where they're coming from but that doesn't mean that you're really better qualified to minister to that sinner. You don't have to be an adulterer, former adulterer, to be able to minister to people who have committed adultery. Uh, so this is a false qualification. So he's putting in qualifications and then saying, see, I meet this qualification because I've committed these sins. I know where these sinners are coming from. And so I can better relate to them. I can really talk to them. I can fellowship with them because I know what they're going through. But you see, that's not a qualification for ministry in the church. That's not a qualification for being a pastor. Uh, what qualifies you are a whole set of other different qualifications. So we shouldn't listen to Tullian when he tells us that he's qualified and he lists a qualification that isn't even found in the Bible. Now, there is reference to we comfort those in the comfort that we've received from the Lord. We can empathize with other people because of the empathy of God for our uh, problem. And so, yeah, there's reference to that in, in a counseling situation. And this would probably be where Tullian would best be suited, that he would be able to meet with people who are broken and repentant over their sins, and he would be in a counseling situation. But it seems like he has this, uh, this desire to be in front of people. He has to be in, in the public limelight. This is what I noticed before, after this latest scandal broke in, in 2016, uh, three years ago. Uh, he was being interviewed and he loved to talk about himself and he loved to talk about experiences and he just, you could tell that he enjoyed getting that attention in public and that was a red flag. I thought at the moment, I said, this man really needs to go away and not be in the public limelight. He needs to get out of sight and needs to get away and he needs to... Um, you know, meet with God alone and, and, and get himself in a solid position and not just go out there and get interviewed by everyone that wants to interview him, radio, television, whatever. He needs to 
disappear and just search his soul and 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 get on his knees and then perhaps at some future time he can take some kind of low position low profile position in a church or ministry situation and not put himself um, out there and be this high profile in the limelight in front of hundreds of people or even thousands of people because that was the thing that you know looking back that's probably part of the problem that he had to begin with he loved the attention he loved the affirmation and that's what he said himself in these interviews he says he he put um the messenger ahead of the message he in other words he put himself in front of christ he he loved the attention instead of deflecting the attention from him to god okay so if that's the problem and that was the problem then he needs to not jump into a high profile up front position he needs to take a back uh, seat position and work very closely under the authority of another pastor he needs to maybe possibly be uh, on staff at a church yes if the gifts and in the callings and the abilities and the experience are there uh, maybe behind the scenes uh, not on, not up front not talking to big crowds, not talking to large radio audiences or television audience, or not writing articles for for thousands of people to read in publications. He needs to take a low-profile position. And that would help him to test his own heart. Because, really, we're talking about a man who deceived his congregation. He was keeping these affairs secret and he was conducting these affairs in secret he was deceiving people now how does he know that he's not going to fall into that same pattern of deception how does he know he's not even deceiving himself right now see that's where he needs to sit under other pastors who have not disqualified themselves and who are solid and strong and who can mentor him and hold him accountable very carefully hold him accountable he needs to be held very carefully accountable because he doesn't really even know um, whether his his so-called recovery is sincere or not so he needs to uh, assume that the heart is deceitful above all things uh, and he needs to place himself under a careful accountability. Um, in a recent podcast with theologian R.C. Sproul, Tavigian compared his attitude, aptitude for the job of how Alcoholics Anonymous meetings are, are run by former alcoholics. The best person to reach someone who is crashing and burning is someone who has crashed and burned themselves maybe that is not something in the bible that is not a biblical axiom that is not a biblical statement we do not have that as revelation the best person to reach someone who is crashing and burning is someone who has crashed and burned themselves maybe i could also think of another scenario the worst person to reach someone who's crashing and burning is someone who crashed and burned themselves because in reaching out to that person who's crashing and burning they may fall again into the same sin and we've seen that happen before in different ministry forms people who are not ready who are not mature enough who are not strong enough they think oh you know i've been a former alcoholic i want to go in and reach those alcoholics then well they go over there and then they have a drink and they have another drink and they're all of a sudden alcoholic again or uh people who are trying to uh, break addictions um they're overconfident in their recovery and they go oh yeah i'm going to go over and minister to these sexual addicts because i've been there and so they march in there real bold they're telling everybody they're ready and they fall into the same sin again and again sounds like tullian is coming across as overconfidence and that's the problem overconfident people and um, here's what he says 
Uh, this morning the sanctu- at the sanctuary, Christianity isn't supposed to be about gathering up the good people and excluding the bad people for the very simple reason that there aren't any good people. Okay, that's true. There aren't any good people in the technical sense. Uh, it, it, Christianity isn't supposed to be about gathering up the good people and excluding the bad people. Well, I don't know of any church that officially says we're going to exclude the bad people. And we're only going to take the so-called good people. No, that is a caricature of church. It's not true. Now, it is true that there are some churches that look at some sins as worse than other sins. And, and there are sins that are worse than other sins. For example, thinking about adultery is wor- is less than committing adultery. Committing adultery is worse than just thinking about adultery. Um, stealing is worse than thinking about stealing. Um, So yeah, there are different grades of sin. They're all, they're all deadly and they can all uh, send a soul to hell uh, if unconfessed and unrepented and, and Jesus' blood is not covering those sins with his death on the cross. Yes, all sin is deadly, but that doesn't mean that all sins are the same. So um, some churches have the false notion that yeah we we we're not gonna we're not gonna let you know uh you know this kind of person in or that that's wrong that's bad but, but most churches no they're looking for anyone who will come most pe- most churches and most pastors are very welcoming um so this is kind of a false uh, a false straw man you know no churches are not excluding people um but some Christian sexual abuse survivors and advocates aren't so sure that Chavidian is fit to lead a congregation. He hasn't demonstrated that he understands the nature of sexual abuse, they say, and is misusing Christian teachings about grace to give him a pass. Well, that's true. That's, that's what I'm saying. Pastors accused of abuse can sometimes exploit Christian teachings about forgiveness and grace to claim positions of power within a church, according to Wade Mullen a scholar at Lancaster Bible College who studies how evangelical organizations seek to escape abuse scandals. Uh, Mullen told HuffPost he believes that there's a difference between receiving God's grace and receiving God's endorsement for occupying a position of spiritual authority, a distinction he thinks Tavidian is conflating. Pastors seeking to retain or regain their power might use God as their primary endorser, Mullen said. But this can be a powerful tactic of manipulation because he, who wants to stand in God's way? Both Shavijan and the sanctuary have not responded to HuffPost's request for comment. So the point there is this guy is saying, well, I think Shavijan might be using it as a means to get back um, into a position. And... Shavijan was fired from an administrative job at Willow Creek Presbyterian church in winter spring florida uh, in 2016 because of an inappropriate relationship one year earlier he'd lost his job as senior pastor at coral ridge presbyterian church in fort lauderdale for having an affair with a female congregant while he was married the congregant has said that she thought of chibidjan as a pastoral counselor and that the relationship amounted to sexual abuse so it goes on it talks about he's had two affairs he has since divorced from his first wife and remarried. However, he claims he didn't play the role of counselor in the congregant's life. He still insists the relationship was consensual and did not amount to abuse. Okay, so he's been divorced now. He's been remarried. He's got a lot of things happening. And it just seems like he really needs to slow down and he needs to take a step back. Um, D. Parsons, editor of a blog that exposes abuse in Protestant churches, told HuffPo she believes that just as licensed therapists are prohibited from having sexual relationships with their clients, a pastor who has had sex with a congregant shouldn't be allowed to lead congregations. Uh, okay, so yeah, that raises that question. Um, there was a question of abuse of power. And um, 
there needs to be um, definitely accountability. There needs to be, uh, you know, all kinds of safeguards so that this doesn't happen again. And um, HuffPost has said the sanctuary, uh, asked the sanctuary what accountability structures it has in place to ensure that the church is a safe place for abuse survivors, but did not receive a reply. Forsyth said she absolutely believes in God's grace and forgiveness. However, she thinks that should include acknowledgement of our failings and acceptance of the consequences of our actions. Chavidjan is full of Christian language that breezes past his lack of acknowledgement and acceptance, Forsyth wrote in an email. To claim he is uniquely qualified to lead another church body shows he has no understanding of the consequences of his actions. So, and I think that that is something that I have noticed in the interviews that I have seen of him. I've noticed that there seems to be a lack of remorse. Um, he doesn't seem to grasp the depth of the damage that he did. And he wants to just jump right back into ministry. He wants to take up uh, where he left off and get into the preaching and get into the teaching. And he wants to um, be restored and all these things. But really, that is not something that he should have the say in. Um, he could be working toward restoration and all that, but there really needs to be a process, a long process, uh, one that can't be bypassed, one that can't be manipulated. He needs to have a long process of rehabilitation that starts with very, very simple things. And over the years and over the decades, possibly at some point, way, way, way down the road, he can be up in front of people. But I really think it's bad news for someone who has drug congregations through all kinds of mud with his scandal and sin, broken up families, uh, hurt people all over the place, to just begin to advocate for his own restoration. I think that is premature. And like this article says, um, to claim he is uniquely qualified to lead another church body shows that he has no understanding of the consequences of the actions. He needs to not be claiming anything for himself. And that's part of the process of brokenness and repentance. And uh, possibly later on, further on down the road, there could be some position of restoration in, in the church where he's up front. But he seems to be moving way too fast and the body of Christ doesn't want another train wreck that it itself helped perpetuate. And so in order to avoid that train wreck in Tullian's life or in any other pastor who has fallen like he did, there needs to be a slow, long process of rehabilitation. And Tullian seems to be jumping the gun. He's overconfident. He needs to to slow down, and I think and I pray that the body of Christ needs to slow him down. Well, I hope that's been a helpful commentary, and we'll see you back next week on another edition of Christ and Culture. God bless.